Hello everyone and welcome to the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice webinar today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Annette Morand and I am the facilitator of the online adaptation communities of practice and those are run by us here at OPR, which is the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources and we're located at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. So the way the webinar will run is as follows. So after the short introduction, we will have the main presentation, which will go for about 30 minutes. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time left for any questions that you might have for the presenter. So if you have any questions during the webinar, we just ask that you please hold on to your head. So before we get going, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. So first, for those of you who dialed into the conference call line, your lines have been automatically muted. Um, and the reason for this is just to avoid any audio distractions or feedback in the webinar. So to ask a question during the question and answer period, all you're going to have to do is dial star six, and that will unmute the line. Um, but please do keep your line muted during the presentation. Also, you'll notice that there's a chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. So you can use this chat box to field any questions that you might have for the presenter during the session. Um, as well, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can also use this chat area to type a message, or you can actually click on my name and send me a private message, and I can try to help you as best as I can. I also want to mention that we are recording the webinar today. Um, I'll be sending out a copy of the recording to all those who have registered with me, um, and we'll also be posting it to the Community of Practice website. And finally, I know we have some people on the line who may not be familiar with what Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice, or the FACOP, is. So I wanted to take this opportunity to quickly mention that it's an interactive online. Um, it's dedicated to those who are working in forestry or those who are simply interested in forestry and climate change adaptation in Canada. It includes features such as news articles, events, an online library, discussion forums, and much more. So it's free to join. Uh, if there's anybody on the line who's interested in learning more about the FACOP, please just click on the link in the chat box for more information and to register. So with that, um, we're very excited to have Elliot McIntyre on the line with us today to talk about the open model platform. And just so you know a little bit more about your presenter, Elliot received a PhD in forest ecology from the University of British Columbia in 2003 and did a postdoc at the University of Montana where he worked on wildlife biology. Since 2011, Elliot has been working with the Pacific Forestry Center as a research scientist, where some of his research interests include ecological forecasting, forest ecology, quantitative ecology, forest disturbances, spatial analysis, and ecological modeling. Um, before joining the Canadian Forest Service, Elliot held a Canada Research Chair at Laval University, and he holds a master's degree in botany from the University of Toronto and a bachelor's degree in biology from McGill University. So on behalf of everyone joining us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you, Elliot, for taking the time to present this webinar for us today. Very much appreciated. So without further ado, I will now turn things over to you. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I will take anybody's silence as being that everything is working. Of course, because we tested a few minutes ago, that, sh that should be OK. Usually silence is a bad thing, but here, go with it. Today, I have given the title to this talk that's somewhat of a, of a continuous verb tense, getting to answers. That means a couple of things. One is that we're not there yet, so you know, there's, we have no, uh, we have a long way to go, of course, and so, but, but we're trying a new way of getting to those answers. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. So in, when I do this talk, or when I've given this talk in front of people, I actually do a bit of a sing-along. It's going to be slightly modified because, uh, the piece, because it, I don't think it'll work very well in the webinar format. So we'll just walk through it uh, and, and imagine that we'd all be singing together. Uh, some people in the room locally here might have been here when I last gave this little talk. But we'll go hopefully quite a bit beyond that. In this talk, I have more than the nine minutes that I had that time. So this phase as a conductor and a musician, and then a bit more, a slightly more technical way of thinking about space, what it's doing. Then there's uh, a decision support system that we're calling in space, which uh, I will present. And then I'm going to sort of wrap 
to start wrapping it up by by really talking about this notion of answering questions as opposed to you know so questions first, data and models are, are second, and that's quite a different way for some for some people, uh, especially in the scientific community, for for doing some of this stuff. And then uh, finally, just to try to make let people realize that space will look different depending on who you are, and that's okay. That's part of the the open notion of of doing science and data. All right. So what we're going to do uh, virtually is we're all going to I've put up a list of of songs here. We could imagine each of us picking a song and then you know deciding okay I'm going to I'm going to that's that's one that I might might want to sing right now. And so the idea for this exercise is just that every person in this room and in this webinar would pick a song in their head and they wouldn't tell anybody about it. And then they would get ready to sing and then start singing. And we can imagine that everybody would just be singing different things. It would become a cacophony. Activity two version of this is that we, we, we can each, we pick a song again, but this time we're going to talk to our neighbor and say, all right, I'm going to sing London Bridge and so are you. We're both going to sing London Bridge Falling Down together. And then, you know, we're going to get ready to sing. But there's still, you know, right now 35 people uh, on the participant list and about 15 people in this room. So 50 of us, even paired up, we would still sound pretty cacophonous and chaotic if we all started singing. So maybe if we wanted to create music, we would need more coordination. And that's, that's okay. But how, if we did it that, you know, talk to your neighbor, and talk to your next neighbor, and talk to your next neighbor, that would take a long time, especially if we're all standing, you know, thousands of kilometers apart. So a third option is what I call here the space station, but of course there are others, and in fact, musicians do this all the time, is this notion of a, a conductor at the front. We don't have to have everybody uh, to talk to each other and agree upon what they're singing and how they're going to read the music. They just have to figure out how to listen to a conductor. So in this case, I will be the conductor, and I will tell us all that we're going to sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And we can even go beyond that once we have the power of a conductor. We can say, well, half of the people are going to start you know, on three, and the other half are going to wait until they're done that first line. And on three, we go. And presto, we can all imagine, of course, that we are singing a song, a bunch of people who've never talked to each other, just because there's a central coordinator. So if you have one musician, you don't need a coordinator. If you have two or three musicians, you can figure it out by talking with those other musicians. But once you start having five, seven, twenty, or a hundred, it's time consuming, chaotic, can't agree on what which song, etc. So space as a conductor, this notion that's what space is. And so the musicians are models. In this case, logical models, um, forest models, all sorts, economic models. The ecological world, of course, is full of soloists, happily singing their songs, full of models that hang out by themselves and do potentially wonderful things. And some of them are very specific at one thing. So others are like pianos. They try to be all part for all people, but they still sound like a piano. Um, and they, so there's still, there's, there are just a lot of musicians out there. There are a lot of models. So with this notion of musicians that can get, that can learn how to play with space, Spades, of course, is then only the, the, the corollary that Spades is only as good as the musicians that can play in the band. Now, even if there are musicians that can play with Spades, they're still musicians. They can have solo careers, too. They are modular in one, with one vernacular. They can form temporary duets, quartets, entire orchestras. They can disband. They can reconfigure. So who knows how to play in this band so far? Uh, there are a list of... of pre-existing models in the world um, that are have been worked on by us and by others, uh, including CBM CFS3, which is 90% completed, uh, or at least a portion of it in space. Uh, Biosim, the sort of that one is initiated discussions with Jacques Sagnard and uh, Demi. Landed Biomass 2 succession, this is 100% completed and we're starting to publish with it. Uh, Beacons, Landmine, Caribou, there are several others that are all in the, in the either in the works or are finished and are starting to be used, and both in a scientific perspective, so they're being published, and in 
a applied perspective is they're being used by various things. Of course, at the same time, there are new musicians that are that did not already exist. They're learning how to play. And so some of these, I have some graduate students and postdocs that are working on some new ones. There are also uh, collaborators and uh, people who I may or may not know about have started to contact us and talk about modules, models that they're building. And but currently, ones that you know we are aware of are fire models, insect models, mammal models, and then uh, some support modules like GIS operations, data manipulation. Of those details, there's lots of those going on in the background, and then of course, because this is open source, there are uh, there are potentially other unknown models that are being used. We currently, have 1,837 downloads made, uh, which is still essentially an alpha an alpha software. So that we're pretty sort of happy with that, and they're coming from 77 different countries. Those downloads. We've also started to add other frameworks into space that have been widely used. So NetLogo is modeling framework that's been, uh, that is widely used for agent-based modeling. And so we sort of re-implemented that so it can now be used. Uh, not, it's, not a, it's not calling that logo module models, but you can rewrite or write from scratch that logo type models with that logo, logo vernacular, but it will work with R and space. So we, uh, another one, we've re-implemented some of those low-level functions that are there. So if you know of either these modeling frameworks that are already there, they are now the part of the space R E flow. Now, while we're, there's still a growing sense of what space is, and um, what, what's important at this point is that space exists. And that means that just, just that alone means that new models coming onto the scene can anticipate working with a conductor. So out of, without, before even starting to contemplate a new model, that's going to, you know, you have to think, well, I want to do a model for timber supply. Right out of the starting gate, you can say, well, we don't have to worry about the vegetation dynamics. We want that there because there are already vegetation dynamic models that would work. So I can just focus on one new component and work and live within this framework. So we can be more creative out of the starting blocks because we don't have to worry about who's going to do that fire part that we decide. So once we have this conductor, then a bunch of things start to become very natural. Uh, cumulative effects, risk analysis, the support with things like bow ties, uh, natural range of variation, forecasting, ensemble modeling, and uncertainty analysis. And I'm going to go a little bit more in depth now um, as to, you know, I, I, sorry, a less metaphorical way of talking about what the framework is. What is a framework? So imagine we have an objective A, which there are some spatial, we have, we have spatial data, we want to do something about uh, forecasting fires and forecasting vegetation, and we want to have help. We have objective A2, which is similar, except we decide that we probably want to include climate data in there. We want to have the fire spread and session respond to changing climate. Um, objective B would be something that's totally different, spatial data, biomass, carbon, except for output, maybe similar, spatial data looks similar. Objective C, we can just start to imagine that we could have many objectives, of course. And if we sort of rewrite these with just the first letters of what they were, and uh, I would have this, this next slide here, we, start, we see that we can start to think about these different uh, objectives. So the objectives are now color coded here. Uh, uh, A, A2, B, and A, the final one. Um, these are color coded. And so that object model A uh, was was this. It looked like this. It started with spatial data, had fire model and a session model, and it had output. Model A2 is something similar, but uses a different, maybe a different fire model, and it includes climate. And we can imagine at this point once we started to to show the this the set of objectives this way this visual way we can start to realize hey what why are we sticking up with the blue uh, circles the blue module when we we also have access to another fire model that is not the one that we are thinking of that we need in the first place because, because it already exists in the space community of modules we can potentially treat 
fire as an unknown or as a hypothesis and use another uh, fire module that's going to forecast our fire for us in, in that same objective. Model B is very similar, but it added, sorry, added carbon. And we can then start to imagine connecting, essentially connecting different dots to get to a different objective. We can have multiple types of input data. We could have, re, you know, have multiple types of outputs. We could reuse different outputs dependent, you know, for different combinations of models. Because essentially, once we built models, that, was, that took a lot of work. We want to be able to reuse them and have other people use them. And this type of framework will allow that sort of thing to happen. So as we put modules, or we can, we can think of modules as being part of a category of something like uh, climate or habitat or insect, there could be many modules that, that do something similar to that. And you can start imagining that we could put different, we can start to put different models together that may or may not have been designed from the get-go as work. So that means we can start to, rather than start from the models and the data, we can start from questions, which, where we don't actually contemplate or limit ourselves to what models and what data are there. So for example, I want to know the carbon and timber supply of the relaxing fire control in area X. So that implied a, a, a series of things, including fire, but also fire management, uh, succession, biomass, uh, carbon. So some of those that I just listed off were explicit in the question, but others were implicit. So for example, succession dynamics were not asked part of the question, but because have it available there, we can include it as part of the answer. We can start to just be very creative in what kinds of questions we want to ask without limiting ourselves to any domains that might have thought we had to limit ourselves. So I want to know the potential impact of climate change on caribou habitat in unmanaged areas of the boreal. So it just becomes a different combination of modules. LandWeb is a project coming out of the Foothills Research Institute that uh, one of their objectives is to help uh, forest companies and the various governments of West Province to assess that the natural range of variation, which is a, a quantity that is important for, for uh, certification purposes. Many of these companies are being forced or, you know, in order to maintain or get their certification, they needed to demonstrate that their practices are not falling out better. So the land web project was created, and that's one of the things it's answering. And so spades is at the core of answering this another question. Okay, so we have that framework underlying there. So some of that can be, I didn't talk very technical, I hope. Um, and what, what the goal eventually is to create, and we have, I'll show you what we have at this point, to create a system where you can go dive into the system from that questioning perspective. And you don't necessarily have to know, be a modeler in order to. So this is just a series of screenshots. I didn't, I decided that for the webinar purpose, wouldn't be able to show this live, but this is uh, a live web service right now that is where we can, you know, when you load it up, it looks something like this, where uh, we have a map of Canada, and by default, a set of polygons are loaded, but we can, I'll uh, show you, we can switch those at the moment. But um, as we mouse over different places, we get the, I know you, we can't actually see this, the, the, the words there, part of the red. Um, that's just the label of what that particular polygon is. On the top left, there's a, there's a series of input boxes, and I, I have the text of this. I'm going to show you the text of these boxes in a later slide. But this idea of, of those three, there are three or four text boxes there that we can ask questions like, what is the effect of climate change? And the, that box there shows that pop up help that talks about the type of things that might be asked. on fire severity, let's say, uh, from today through to you know, some other year into the future, 2040. And then we initialize and we start. Before I actually start, we can obviously we can interact with these things. We can change which polygons we're looking at. We can select, you know, the western provinces if we want. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can 
selecting things based on for. Um, and of course, it's pretty easy now to play with all these online base layers, so you can look at different things uh, in, the, in the background behind the polygon layer. So let's say we select one of these polygons and say we want to answer that question, uh, this polygon. So we would start, and as we build more and more of these, the, the more people, we have a, a whole system in the background on the web server that the, if people keep asking the same question, then the results become almost, almost instant because they're cached. Uh, so they're, as, it, as they're sort of running, getting towards an answer, should it give you a series of, of uh, snapshots as it's getting to the end, eventually when it gets to the end. And we have a, a framework for starting to, be, to do initial analyses, and of course you can download all of the, the answers that resulted from your quest, or you can work with them here. And uh, this, this whole thing is, is interactive. I can't, I'm not showing that right now. Uh, can't because of the, the, the bandwidth. Um, but we can be selecting a whole series of different outputs that were derived. The sort of the first version of the output that gets shown automatically are derived from the question that you put in. What is the correct time size variance? And we can. There's, this is the part that we're working very actively on. We have a several students working on this right now. And yeah. So the details of this, we it's not obviously not particularly clear to show it. Uh, but more importantly, scales are still uh, not, not, we're not operational at this point. You know, they're not particularly important other than this set of framework for analyzing the results of that. As we, I sort of, there are a series of tabs up at the top, and I sort of went back one tab to the left, so I, now there's a blue bar over the fifth tab, and this, this shows how, what, when I ask my question, I can, I can skip all the details of this stuff if I want, or I can go in and say, hey, how did we get to that answer? What were there modules that were chosen, and what were they, and why were they chosen? So each of this is showing the dependencies among the series seven modules that were chosen to answer that question. And we can switch to another piece, and this shows those seven modules across the top and bottom, and it shows how the data are being moved between different uh, module, which ones are output for one or become input for another. And this whole sort of dependency is happening in the background. Space sort of figured out what it needed based on a whole series of things, including you know, input, that, that question. And then what I'll get to in the next few slides is this notion of creating a an app that is specific for your purpose. Uh, this one show up. Notion of question first, data and model second. So this is the text that was in one of those that first box. So I uh, contacted numerous. I am a scientist, but I uh, started working with policy people in the Canadian Forest Service, and I said, "What are I, uh, the types of give examples of questions that are constantly being asked to answer?" and there were a whole list of 273 that got answered in a survey, and we sort of got whittled down to groups of types of policy questions. And then for now, I was going to focus on this, which is a sort of a generic version of what type of policy questions some of the policy people are to answer. So, for example, what is the forecasted impact be of X on Y to region Z? So X here could be all sorts of things, Bruce Bidewarn epidemic, closure of a newsprint, decline in price of lumber, increased demand for lumber in China, et cetera. On Y, timber supply, forest area, carbon sequestered, stored, et cetera. And then Z is some spatial domain. It could actually be all of Canada, national. It could be the managed forest, the unmanaged forest, the all of And so that's we sort of built the first, that first version of the app around this the ability to answer these So this approach turns the data-driven approach, the one that scientists generally prefer, on its head. So rather than think of the world as data sets and hypotheses, uh, and then we figure it, sorry, rather than then doing that and figuring out what questions those data can answer, which is how science generally works, of course there are many, many ways, but that is a common thing. We here 
start with the question without thinking of the data, without thinking of the discipline. So that's how we start to note this notion of integrating across disciplines. Uh, this is one way to dive into that. So if you have a question that you have to uh, deal with fire or caribou or carbon or climate, the idea of space, you can have an application, let's say, would be CFS approved, would have CFS approved fire, carbon, climate, caribou modules, et cetera, that, so that the answers would involve modules that uh, would be approved or certified, uh, and therefore the answers would be something that we could rely on. And of course, even at that point, it's a constant feedback system that we're constantly assessing, learning, updating, truly adapting. So the in spades idea is that the apps themselves are, they are a dime a dozen. It doesn't, you know, this first version as we work out kink is taking longer than we had hoped, but once we sort of have gone through this, then we can build apps extremely quickly. And so they can be for all sorts of different things, like the FS certification app or a caribou recovery app, disturbance and climate sensitive timber supply app. Um, as long as there are modules that can address those issues, then you can very easily build a, a an app that will do all the stuff that is needed. And I point out that these do not exist yet. These are hypotheticals. Right now, the ones that I am working on with my teams are for LandWeb, which is Foothill Research, and 20 partners that are the forest companies and provinces, and then Canadian Forest Service, second. So there are potential lots uh, that we could imagine that we would not be involved directly in building, but other people can take what they like. So once we have the framework, the conductor, we can imagine uh, and users can create all sorts of customized apps. One of the things that I have heard and I've been for, I've been in with the Canadian Forest Service for just over four years is this notion that policy works at a much faster rate than science. Science is over years and decades. It takes a long time to collect data. It takes a long time to build models. Policy questions may maybe may need answers in hours, days, weeks, or in best case scenario, months. Um, so this notion of this space ecosystem of modules that is that is constantly growing, we more as modules become built and connected to the ecosystem of modules, they are always there and ready. And so the policy questions can be going at their speed, and the science can be going at their speed, and they become coupled because of the system. So the integration is occurring by starting from the question. So policy management questions can be asked and updated daily, weekly, monthly. Perhaps some of the input data sets will have changed from day to day. You might have timed your question, you know, between an update in a module or a data set. Uh, so answers will be as up to date as possible because the system itself may be updated. So we can cross disciplines without needing to integrate in quotes. We don't, we don't have to actively integrate. The whole thing is to get integrated system. They are already integrated. So we can talk about, we could build a pest management app or a forest management app or a wildlife management app, or we can build ones that do, that, that integrate across. So we can start building true integrated management and then things like cumulative effects, important uh, efforts ongoing and across many departments. They, that just becomes very, it makes sense what that means, cumulative effect, as because they're already integrated. Okay, this is this last point is sort of trying to end this talk where I, it's not, we won't say it's a plea for, for people to, to contribute, but you know, hopefully I get to the point where it says this is not just about modelers, for example. It's about a whole bunch of different people involved in an integrated system like this. So, space looks different for every user. I have listed five bolded types of people from the top land managers, land owners, regulators, policy analysts, public scientists, public policy. So, those, that first group, what I put in parentheses, is not interested in models, they're just interested in answers. The next group are potential scientists, the public, managers, landowners, regulators, policy analysts. Some of those are the same. Here, there's a little bit more interest in going a little bit deeper in models. 
but at a high level. They're not going to be changing models there, but they are interested in, you know, in clicking on the part where you dive into the model to find out more about what happened and how you change. So then scientists who can use models, a little bit sort of more intricate scientists slash models who can create models, and then programmers who can help do all sorts of things, including help make models fast, help them be powerful, et cetera. So on the right-hand side, notion of domain knowledge clustered in the middle group. Uh, programming skills are generally stronger as you go down. And decision-making role are generally bigger as you go up. So all of these people, type of people, can certainly have uh, contributions and both input and output with uh, and I just wanted to go quickly over some of the people that are involved today. So I looked, I talked about some of the models that are uh, that are in. But so there's myself and a postdoc, Alex Scotty, uh, several people uh, at Laval University coming, and several of his students. Some of their are my students also. Uh, ADM Innovation Fund at CFS, um, and some of the members of the Carbon Accounting Team. Externally, uh, money we've we've gotten money and uh, or Potentially money from every from several, including FRI, uh, NSERC, Beacon, uh, Federal Caribou Recovery Plan. Uh, that's been that's not committed yet. Um, and then there are several other people who have shown uh, interest, certainly positive interest, or or more so. So, for example, we have got some money from the government, sorry, from the biodiversity. Um, uh, no, I'm forgetting the name. Uh, collaboration with the government of Alberta, FRI, uh, with John Statt, the exact, uh, which is some money to build some modules for uh, heterogeneous fire, uh, fire burning. And then, yeah, so both internally, externally from the CFS, within universities, within provincial, federal governments, and NGOs, well, some of the NGOs are part of the FRI uh, partnership. So this is open to the world today. It's already online as a toolbox to work with. It's certainly in, in what we would call alpha beta stage. So we, you know, as we have people using these things. We have a group online that talk about problems they've been having. Uh, period, we're still finding a bug here and there, but they're, they're the last six months about five bugs. So we're feeling pretty confident about that. Um, and the development of the app framework, that in space idea, is still very active. So we need, of course, to for the the more people become connected to a system like this, the more it becomes integrated and able to, to deliver on and get to those answers. So we need policy management people, developers, modelers, scientists to push the limits of space. Uh, Space.predictopology.org, where uh, sort of a front page for some of this stuff is, but there are links in that page for all sorts of uh, other. And that was all. So I guess at this point, I took uh, about half an hour, and I would like to ha receive questions if there are anybody with questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Elliot. Um, so we have lots of time for questions. Again, if you'd like to use the chat box, please feel free to go ahead and type out the question. Um, and if you're on the conference line with us, I would prefer to ask a question for the telephone. Just hit star six, and that will be fine. So I see some people are typing here. So I'll go to the phone lines first. Is there anybody that has a question for Elliot? Please go right ahead. If not, uh, Mike has a question here in the chat box. Um, so he's wondering about how. Hello. Oh, hello. 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 Would you like to ask hello. a question? Hey. Am I allowed to ask a question? It's uh, an income from the Federal Geospatial Platform, and I can. Yes, hello. Hi. Yeah, this is a very, very interesting and inspiring indeed. And what a question I have, there, actually I could have many questions, but the first question I have is uh, about data. How do you anticipate, you know, the data that your model is going to use will come to support your model from? Whichever module you have or whichever model you have, 
in the end, it was the data that was used to run and generate the output and support the final output. So have you thought about uh, the data, how you're going to get it, how you're going to do um, it? Yes. What kind of data? Yeah. Yeah. So um, clearly, as a scientist, data is, is ever present in my brain. Uh, if you're doing models with no data, I call that video games. That is a very lucrative industry, but that's not what we do. So yes, absolutely, data is is a critical part of it. So the way that space works is it's called modular. And so what that means is that each module declares its own dependency. So if that if a module has some data dependency, it needs to declare them. And so when you put together a collection as a, as, you know, of, you know, like those output, the colored circles that I had in that framework box, they, um, each of those modules will have some dependencies that are, that are stated by the module itself. So if the model developer is creating a model that has essentially data that are impossible to get, then that module will not be useful. So if those data are Table can be gotten. The part of the module is, is to say how those data can be gotten, sources of those data. If, like for the federal ge geospatial platform, those data have persistent links, which, as I understand from Brian Lowe, they do. You can build this your that module with that persistent link. So somebody who's new to this module, they can just say, "Okay, run this," and the data downloads be the first step. And of course, that is you know a lot of um, potentially massive amounts of data, and that's one reason why this whole thing will likely work best as a web service. Because when you've got you know terabytes of data, it's hard to move that around. Um, so the whole notion of user access control, which the Federal Geospatial Platform is working on, that we are also uh, we more or less have developed that as well. Um, this yeah, so so absolutely, data is is critical, but it's a, it's a module level that that happens. Um, I was going to answer uh, my, so let me just, sorry, before I go, did that answer your question well enough? And just to point out that the Federal Geospatial Platform would be a likely good place to get data for these modules. So if a module developer was doing, creating something and those data were existing on the FTP, that, mm -hmm. that would be an excellent use of that. So, yeah, on the other hand, it could be uh, one scenario. Could be that uh, your model will sit on the platform, so it will be ready to make use of any data that's provided or updated or expanded, so that uh, the module always is able to use the uh, most, uh, you know, best data. Right? That's exactly yes. You see that a possibility? So yeah. So yes. one of the things there's a whole bunch of slides that I didn't put up including this one here, it's called the Open Science Workflow. And this notion is that when you build modules, you start from the raw data step. And so the data cleaning and the data analysis and parameter estimation, that part of the data handling needs to become embedded in your module. I didn't really talk about the fact that Spades is written with the language called R, which is cur currently the most the most or one of the two most important languages for data analysis in the world. And so the idea is if your data set updates, gets updated, you just run this whole thing again and it automatically goes all the way through to publication and report, web, um, and you know, the whole, the whole piece. If you're redoing the same thing year after year, for example, for a report, you just start the whole thing again, but the whole thing is, is automated up to the point where you want it to be automated, and that includes going all the way back to raw data. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So, you so, also can see... Can I, like, I'm going to move on. Uh, can I move on to another person's question, please? Definitely. Um, yeah, uh, thank yeah, you. So, so um, Mike, re re -enough. Um So, this, the question here, I'm not sure if everyone can read it, but it's uh, touching on the issue of uh, uncertainty error assumptions. So the, a key point here is that at some point, if you have a lot of modules, I would presume the error will exceed 
how do you keep track of significant assumptions in each module to make sure that they're communicated to the end user? So the approach that I, so first of all, users can do all sorts of things, whatever they want. The approach that I advocate for is the same thing that we do, scientists and the, and the community of working in climate models has done, which is we don't, we don't spend, you know, a, a year describing all of the assumptions in every single model and all of the potential repercussions of all of the assumptions. Instead, what we do is we treat models as hypotheses. And so we have not just one model with all of its assumptions and uncertainty, but we have 10 models. And when we use them and we, we can start to identify them as this is a conservative model, this is a status quo model, and they, have, they each have different assumptions, both uh, in, in their input data as well as in their, the module parameterization, driving functions, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can start to do things like consensus uh, output, consensus models. We can do uncertainty analysis across models. So if 10 models are able to give us an answer that is comparable amongst them, we can say, well, perhaps, oh, look, it turns out that 20% of the of Canada has, you know, put this a, a really wonderful agreement across these 10 models, but 80% of Canada has very has relatively low agreement, and you can then go into detail. Okay, of that 80%, there are you know there's different levels where the modules disagree with them. So, I while assumptions are absolutely critical, it's really difficult to evaluate what all the consequences of every assumption in a model is, and that's it. You can literally spend 25 years going down that path, and you know I've done that for some of the models. Just you know, do sensitivity analyses, and you you can explore this for a long time. So that's certainly doable, and you should. But an important alternative that this allows, you have a framework like this, is notion of intermodal comparison, cumulative uh, or sorry, consensus uh, disagreement, uncertainty analysis across the model. So Mike, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, we certainly think about that a lot. Um, so there's a guess. What intermediaries do you expect to bridge the decision community and the research community? Um, I'm not sure. Is that, uh, is that uh, intermediaries as in people? Do we have, who, who would be these intermediaries? Um, that, I don't, I think that all of us, as I stated in um, this, this graph here, we all have a role, a potential role in this process. So for pe people like who are decision community people, they need to be involved to help, uh, you know, identifying what the decisions are that they need to make. So we don't, scientists, of course, and people outside of the specific decision context won't know. Um, so who are the organizations will connect these different communities? Um, so I think that this is, this is uh, open, this is bottom up from many perspectives. So it's self-organizing. So as people decide that this is useful, then they can take this and all of the, and the, the freely available, whichever modules are freely available, which not all of them are, will always be freely available. Some of them will not be. Uh, but that's, we can use this, the framework and the system to, as a catalyst, to bring these communities together because they can be in the same room talking in the same conversation and be delivering answers in real time, even if it's quite complex. So I don't have a specific answer about who are the organizations um, other than all of us. Okay. Thanks so much, Elliot. So I don't see anybody else typing. We'll give us we'll give everybody a few more minutes here. Um, are there is there anybody else on the conference call line who'd like to ask a question? Oh, actually we have Mercedes here that has a question in the chat box and then we'll get back to the conference call line. Um, so I don't know if you want to read it, Elliot, or if... Uh... Yeah. So the question is, uh, how are modules integrated into space? So space, this is a, a little bit more, detail, uh, more um, detailed. So sorry, part two of the question, is this a proactive, i.e. developer's uploading process, 
or how do you ensure wide coverage? So at the moment, uh, we there is an online cloud-based repository for modules that developers can use freely. Um, it doesn't have that many models in it, modules in it yet, because we anticipate the notion that as you develop a module, you'll want to publish with it and then open it up. That may or may not be the case. You might be developing it as an open system from the start. Um, so the, uh, the I'm going to so the, that was answering part two. Part one of your question. So Spaze is a is an R package. So if you are a user of R, that makes sense. What I just said makes sense. If you're not a user of R, R is a language that is for data manipulation, data analysis, statistics, and now data transformation, because that's essentially what all of these modules are, is they're converting data from one state to another. Um, and so you, it, all you have to do is download Spade, the package, very easily. You can, the instructions are just like any other R package. Um, and then you just, there's a series of, there's a wiki, there's an FAQ, and all of this stuff we're developing uh, as we speak. And so documentation is there. We are getting, improving it all the time. We are starting to give two, uh, uh, two or three day uh, courses uh, on Spades. And we know that there will be, because of this notion of multiple types of users, it, we can't have one, one course. Uh, because that won't, it's, you, we're not all these, there are different dimensions to all what they do. So um, the way to make them integrated into Spades is you do what's called, you make your model Spades compatible. And once it's space compatible, then it's, it's part of that space ecosystem. And there are a few steps to that. Um, not okay. Hey. So any modules that to be included in space, it has to be uh, written in R? No. So R is a very high level uh, agno language agnostic language which means that you can write in numerous other languages, including C++, C, Python, Java, uh, JavaScript, and uh, Java, did I say Java, yes, um, Fortran, and many others. And R has uh, API interfaces to all of those languages. So some of the modules that have been developed have been in C++. Um, others are using uh, database backends for data, storing data. So R can handle connections to any sort of database that is, that's out there. It can also handle flat files like CSV for data. It can handle it's R. So at the base, we didn't have to do very much to create space because it's just on top of R. So anything that R can do, space can do. Just added a few, a few important functional Perfect. I don't see anybody else typing. I'll do uh, another shout out to the conference call line. Is there anybody else? Anybody else has a question? Well, I don't want to take you too much time, but uh, if I do have uh, time, I'd like to ask what uh, conceptual level, a kind of picture or concept map is required before? Any modules are inserted to the, the larger music, larger piece of music, like okay. uh, mm -hmm. so the the idea is that the at that larger piece of music level with the the whole orchestra there, the orchestra members don't have to know about each other. You know, on the on the surface, that the goal is the orchestra members don't have to know about each other. They just know about the conductor and the piece of music. And so that's what that, that metaphor in slightly more technical terms is to say in order, in order to play with the band, you've got to be space compatible. And essentially what that is, is describing what data you require and what data you produce. So your input and your output. And that involves several things, including the the format and the content and whatever else um, to sufficiently describe what your data are. And then Spade does the rest and it says, oh, this module doesn't work with any of these other modules. The inputs of that one and the outputs of this one don't match. So therefore, we
we need to do something if we want them to match. And so that's where I sort of glossed over the this. These, we have a there's a type of module we call translator modules that will be potentially very lightweight, but they just move data from one type to another, or you know, one resolution to another. Some of those translators might lose information. Other translators will not lose any information. And so it maintains this ability that, that of, of modularity, but you, you will have, for a particular piece of music, you might have to insert a few important lightweight pieces that actually connect the, the modules. And we'll play that role with that you, the model administrator, space administrator. So no, so space is completely decentralized. We don't have any control over what people do with space. Uh, if we do one particular app, which we might call the CFS 2016 app, um, then we will, at that point, we will create a, a, you know, we'll select a set of modules, and then we will identify a set of um, translators that may or may not be necessary, and then we will create that piece of music for that particular purpose. But Spade itself can, is completely open and decentralized. Anybody can do their own app at any point. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question. So Elliot Mercedes has another post here in the chat box. Okay, so the question is, how do you ensure that those that are developing models make them Spade compatible? More of an outreach or incre increasing awareness of Spade amongst scientists, modelers, and programmers. So I think the best way to do that is to show how it was it's good for that modeler to make their model space compatible because it means that they if they're doing all of this effort they will benefit because there's a whole ecosystem of other, other modules out there that they can tap into by making their own module space compatible. So nobody's going to ensure they don't have to make their model space compatible but it means that they can't access that ecosystem so it means they, they have to play a solo role always. They cannot, yeah, or they start to connect one model at a time. So if they want to benefit from, you know, these wonderful orchestral pieces or a large jazz ensemble, then they, then it, it's a very light cost to create, to make their model space compatible. Um, and, and the benefits can be quite high because they get to access other models and systems. All right. So I see Mercedes is writing again. Um, I actually have one question for you, Elliot. So how long um, until this is operational? Um, so that's an interesting question. So in the, it is currently um, operational. The, the um, sorry, the, it's currently uh, the Beacons Group. Uh, all of their models that they've been using. Um, are are re are, have been made space compatible, and it's a it's a group that's been working on various things about protected areas across Canada, uh, habitat, bird and caribou habitat across Canada, um, and so that that is essentially operational for for their purpose. It's been been done, and they haven't started to use it yet because they have inertia. They have another system that's already in place that they all agree was harder to fix and update and add enhance than the new version. So it's now just a matter of, you know, when you sort of get off the inertia and when they get off the inertia and, and convert. And in the process of, of making those all of their modules space compatible, they found a few things that they may or may not have liked that were in the original version. And so they were able to, to uh, consider changing some things that they were, wouldn't necessarily have considered changing. Um, so it is operational at that level. For Canadian Forest Service, we've got certainly at least another year, my guess. Um, we have all of the parts, but it's just a matter of getting the modules that, that, are, that we would consider operational enough to be where we, the answers are sort of reliable enough that the policy people can rely on. Great, thank you. Right, so there's a question here um, in Victoria. Uh, what about modules being open and public versus closed and private? Um, or I guess you could have open and private, whatever that is. But this, 
you don't have to share your model code. You can, you can take advantage of the fact that there are other modules out there that you can use, and you do not, like, this is, the, this is true of all open source systems. You, you can actually take from the open community and use whatever you need, and you are not obliged to give back. Having said that, everybody benefits as you give back. And so you realize that if you are giving to the system and other people are making the same decision and other people are making the same decisions, then everybody is benefiting. But we know that there are legal reasons why people would not uh, want to open the code of their, their model or module. Um, and you, there's no obligation to do that. You can be running this stuff on your own computer, your own web server. Okay, so Melissa Spearing has a question in the chat box there. Um, my computer just went to sleep, oh. so I have to log in. Okay. Okay. Uh, Melissa Spearing, can the resulting a customized app posted online? What kind of tool they suppose? Static only or ArcGIS type web? So, um, it, the version that we're producing, we're gonna we're pushing it to the Amazon cloud shortly, um, and it is very dynamic. The whole thing is going to start to the the when you ask ask a question, you will get sort of the, a default set of analytical tools that result from your question will be provided at the output level. But you can essentially uh, add as many tabs and sub-tabs of, of GIS-based analysis, fiscal analysis, of whatever you want, um, on the web server uh, as a server. So this whole thing is being built uh, as a dynamic mapping and web serving tool. Sliding bars, you can change inputs, you can upload new data, you can download, you know, you might have done 10, 50,000 replicate simulations across multiple scenarios. Um, the back end, you don't have to know about. If it's on Amazon Cloud, it just runs them all because they've got an infinite number of servers, essentially, and an infinite amount of data storage. So that, that's part, you don't have to worry about how much computational power it is. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're running out of time here, but I'll do a last call for any last minute questions. Um, and Elliot, if people have additional questions, are they able to contact you via email? Is that okay yes, with you? Yes, of course. Perfect. Elliot .macandar .canada .ca. Perfect, and I'll, I'll CC you on the email I send after the webinar, so everybody should have it. Um, any Great, last, uh, last call for questions? No, I guess we'll wrap things up. So um, thank you to everybody who joined us today for the webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, and a very, very big thank you to Elliot for your time and effort and for a really great presentation. Um, any last comments from you before we sign off? Uh, no, I think uh, that, was a, that was enjoyable. I appreciate the questions. Of course, it makes these webinars much more uh, interesting when there's interesting feedback and people thinking about this whole thing. Absolutely. Fantastic. And, uh, uh, we'll probably put up a forum discussion on the FA COP to sort of continue this conversation. So for anybody that's interested, um, you can also uh, uh, do that as well and continue the discussion. So um, with that, uh, thanks everybody for joining. That's it for today. We'll see you next time.